continue our talk on uh, hindrances. This time I want to um, also mention other things that we had to do to overcome hindrances. This morning I mentioned one very important number one uh, method that is uh, mindful reflection. I said mindful, mindful reflection is the reflection on uh, pleasure and uh, uh, then danger, degradation, degradation and uh, defilements and then abandoning or nisarana or nekkama. Those are the stages that we follow when we practice a mindful reflection. Then the, these are called a heap of unwholesomeness. Buddha call it uh, akusala khanda, akusala khanda, unwholesome aggregate. <laughs> like you have various aggregates, but uh, all hindrances put together in one bundle, one group, and call akusala khanda. So we have to cultivate kusalakkhanda to overcome akusalakkhanda. Kusalakkhanda is wholesome aggregate, aggregate of wholesomeness to overcome aggregates of unwholesomeness. Now <coughs> there is very important uh, thing uh, that Buddha mentioned to overcome, in addition to becoming mindful or have mindful reflection, that is uh, exerting energy. This is particularly important even in Mahasatipatthana Sutta and everywhere. Uh, Mahasatipatthana Sutta begins with this word, atapi. Ex exerting energy to overcome the hindrances. Now, uh, also he mentioned uh, restraint. <coughs> restrain our senses. Restraining our senses does not mean that we close our eyes when we, when object is present before us, or plug our ears when sound is coming to our ears, or close our nose when the smell goes through the nose, or put something into our mouth to stop taste. Not that kind of restraint. Uh, restraint is what will happen when senses exposed to sensory objects. When eyes are exposed to visual object, there definitely arises eye consciousness and because of these two there will arise feeling and we have no control over these things. They happen naturally as soon as objects are present to our eyes ears, nose, tongue, body and mind. No control. There is a, a, ob an object, then consciousness. As soon as consciousness arises, of course, there also will be perception and then feelings. When feeling arises, then there arises the when feeling, uh, no, when, then contact that senses, contact. Uh, senses, sensory object, consciousness, 
contact and perception. I, I missed one. As soon as perception arises, feeling arises. Now, when perception arises, he, we have now we have space to exercise our mindfulness. Because perception arises, then we became mindful to know the feelings. Then feeling arises naturally. When feeling arises, it will be either pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. And that this feeling can trigger our greed, hatred, or confusion. When the feeling happens to be pleasant, it can trigger our greed. Greed does not arise from somewhere outside. As soon as this combination takes place, at that time if we are not mindful because of the pleasant sensation, the anusaya, anusaya means uh, uh, underlying tendency underlying tendency, that means uh, desire is there, sitting in our mind, in our subconscious mind, just sitting. Uh, one of my examples is, have you seen leeches? Leeches, they look like a stick. <laughs> they stay like this. You don't know that it is a leech. As soon as you pass that fellow, he jumps and catch you. <laughs> Similarly, Anusaya uh, is in dormant state. As soon as something happens to our senses, then Anusaya becomes active. That is the time mindfulness comes handy to realize that uh, greed arose in us. If the object happens to be pleasant. Now that is the level we can actually uh, nip the hindrance at bud. So hindrance arises, at that time if we remain mindful, we can get rid of it. As I mentioned this morning, if the mindfulness is very hot, <laughs> it is just like hot pan. So as soon as senses uh, come in contact with sensory object, when the uh, greed arises, mindfulness quickly burns it. Just like hot pan, you know, vaporizes the little drop of water falling onto it, mindfulness just burns it. Now, in Mahasatipatthana, in this particular section, Buddha says, Uppanna, uh, Uppanna, uh, uh, Santang va Ajjattang uh, Kama Chandang, Atthime Ajjattang Kama Chanduti Pajana. When uh, hindrance called sense desire, arises, we are practicing mindfulness, practicing mindfulness. Since the mindfulness is in strong state, as soon as hindrance arises, it immediately becomes aware, ah, hindrance arises. Because of the mind power of mindfulness, hindrance will not have a chance to grow. Just like a hot pan, hindrance is very strong, what do you call mindfulness is very strong. As soon as hindrance arises, mindfulness recognizes it and let it go. Mindfulness does not let it grow, but it, it let it go. That is what we are supposed to do in, in that particular section in mindfulness practice. Now, only if that does not happen, then we have to use some other means to get rid of that particular hindrance. So, if that doesn't happen, 
what else we have to do, then those things are mentioned in many, many other places. Number one is what you call n number one line of def defense is mindfulness. Failing which, we use all other possible methods. What are the other possible methods? Restrain. Uh, restrain our senses. There are five kinds of restraints. One is called jnana, restrain is called sangvara. Sangvara. One is jnana sangvara. That means restrained by wisdom, rationally, logically, intellectually, we keep thinking, using those methods, the uh, asada, as I mentioned this morning, asada, that is uh, uh, enjoyment enjoyment of particular pleasure and then the danger, degradation, defilements. When you go through these stages as a restraining process, then we realize next stage of letting go of it. So we follow those five stages with understanding, wisdom, knowledge, rational thinking, and so forth. That is called jnana sangvara, restrained with wisdom. The first teaching is that the sati is the bare mindfulness. Yeah. The next one is reflection. When that doesn't work, just observing the arising of the universe doesn't work. Right. Then you go to the Right. I think it is, that is actually even easier to break down if we break down this in these stages, uh, perhaps it will be even easy to remember. Number one, keep mindfulness intact. So that as soon as something happens, you become mindful and let it go. If that doesn't happen, then you use mindful reflection. That mindful reflection you can call Jnana Sangvara. restrained by wisdom. Then, restrained by wisdom is actually thinking using rational, logical, intellectual process. Then there is another restraint called Satisangvara. That is developing more and more strength power of mindfulness, so that you can prevent it from happening. We restrain our senses by developing mindfulness more intently. Then the four, third method of restraining is called patience, kanti sangvara. Kanti means patience. There are situations where we have to have a lot of uh, 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 patience, uh, uh, tolerance and wait uh, until uh, the body and mind becomes calm to let it go. Because as soon as it happens, it comes in such an overwhelming, such a powerful force. You cannot do anything about it. All of a sudden, it overwhelms you. Then you take a deep breath and say, well, let me wait. Let me wait. This comes so powerful, so strongly. Uh, nothing I can do. Let me wait. So when you wait and wait and wait, you know this, this waiting game 
weighting technique is important uh, technique because we know when we wait time solves problems. That means things are impermanent. Because of impermanence this very powerful forceful uh, my, uh, hindrance itself is slowly becomes weak. Nothing is permanent. Even hindrances are impermanent. But when it comes it appears to us to be so powerful and so permanent. But we got to be, we got to be very patient to settle it down, settle the mind down. And that is a restraint that is called Khanti Sangvara. And the next restraint is called Virya Sangvara. That is really applying our effort. Uh, a part of Virya Sangvara I mentioned this morning that is yeah, three dhatus, three elements, uh, Arambha dhatu, Nikkama dhatu and Parakkama dhatu. That is the uh, uh, initial stage of effort, then uh, persistent effort and then not budging effort, meaning not slackening your effort until you attain the goal and then you take the rest. <coughs> now it is a Virya Sangvara that we that the Buddha has mentioned at the beginning of the discourse. Atapi Sampajanu Satima Vinaya Loke Abhijja Domanasa. Vinaya is restraint, discipline. With effort, we discipline our senses. And when we make effort to discipline our senses, we use fourfold effort. Uh, we all know fourfold efforts effort to prevent, effort to overcome, effort to develop, and effort to maintain. Using all these fourfold efforts is called. Virya Sangvara. These fourfold efforts uh, has, uh, are used in many different ways. They also are used as uh, Iddipada. Iddipada is nothing but exerting fourfold effort. It says Iddipada means Chanda. Chitta, Virya, Vimansa. Chanda means desire, Chitta means the mind, Virya effort, Vimansa investigation. It says Chanda Samadhi, Chitta, Chanda Samadhi, Sankara, Samanagatang, Iddipadang, Bhaveti. Chanda Samadhi, Sankara, Samanagatang, Iddipadam Bhaveti. That is, one develops the basis of accomplishment dependent upon the conditions created by desire. Chanda, Samadhi, Sankara, Samanagatang, Iddipadam Bhaveti. So, Iddipada means the foundation, basis of accomplishment. Here, the basis of accomplishment can be used for gaining supernatural powers, but also basis of accomplishment can be used for gaining an accomplishment of uh, uh, gaining uh, uh, true deep wisdom inside. So, uh, using effort, uh, fourfold effort, we restrain our senses. Fourfold effort. 
and the last restraint is called sila sangvara. You know, you can arrange them in any order you like. Uh, the last one you can put first or the second one, last, uh, whatever. Uh, sila sangvara. Don't try to understand them in this order. You can put them in any order. But the, the thing is the practice of all these fivefold restraints. Sila Sangvara uh, disciplining ourselves in various ways, discipline our, disciplining our mind, disciplining our words, and discipline, uh, disciplining our actions. That means uh, three kinds of three steps of the morality in the four no noble eightfold path. Three steps of morality means uh, vacha, kammanta, ajiva, speech, action, and livelihood. That covers every aspect of morality. When we practice these three steps of the Noble Eightfold Path, we will have a very good discipline. And why do we do, do all this? In order to overcome our hindrances. Practicing uh, morality, now, uh, this is uh, by restraining we overcome hindrances, restraining. <coughs> that is called Sangvara Padhana, Sangvara Padhana. Then the next one is uh, Pahana Padana, we mentioned them, abandoning. Last one, of course, is third is cultivating, last is uh, developing. Then, the abandoning also has three levels. We abandon hindrances at three levels. One level is uh, through insight. That is called Tadanga Pahana. Tadanga. Tadanga means uh, uh, one limb at a time. That is one hindrance we overcome by practicing the opposite of it. And one at a time. For instance, <coughs> When we see greed arising, we deeply involved in the practice of mindfulness to see impermanence. Impermanence. When we see impermanence of anything, there will not be enough room in the mind for greed to arise. Anything that is uh, uh, pleasant is impermanent. So when we see impermanence of any pleasant things, it fades away. Or we cultivate uh, unattractiveness of the parts of the body, various parts of the body. That is mindfulness practice. Uh, these two methods are very pop, very effective. First method is uh, uh, first method actually is looking at unattractiveness of the body, various parts. Unattractiveness of the body has to be seen one at a time, one by one, not all together. If you try to lump all of them together and try to look at, uh, try to see Im, uh, unattractiveness, you cannot see unattractiveness. That is why it has been divided into vanna, santana, gandha, okasa, disa, and so forth. You have to see the color, shape, uh, the, the direction, the location, 
uh, and the space in between. That means you got to make a discrimination. The word discrimination is used very uh, conveniently in Vipassana meditation tradition. Uh, in, in social contact, we cannot use the word discrimination because it has a different meaning. But in the Vipassana meditation tradition, the word discrimination is very conveniently used. That means we have to discriminate, differentiate, separate one by one and look at each of them separately. Isolate each of them to attack. When they are all together, you cannot attack because they support each other and they have a very strong defense. Therefore, if you want to attack them, separate them. That is very, very good technique. Easy to attack. Isn't it? <laughs> You separate each part of the body and look at one at a time. Look at one at a time, very attentively, mindfully. As you look at each of them separately, mindfully, uh, you see impermanence there. So we begin with looking at looking at. Uh, unattractiveness of the body separately one by one at one at a time not with the intention of cultivating hatred or repulsiveness but the but the with, but with the intention of seeing it exactly as it is so the 32 parts the purpose of using the 32 parts of the body is not actually to cultivate uh, the disgust in our mind as we mentioned this morning, cultivating disgust is a cause of ill will, anger. Buddha has mentioned the cause of ill will is a particular sanya or uh, uh, nimitta, uh, particular nimitta, sign of unattractiveness is the object or cause of ill will. So the purpose of divide, uh, discriminating the part of the body or separating the part of the body and carefully, mindfully reflecting on them is not actually to make us disgust about the body. Although the word, uh, 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 what do you call, uh, disappointment, uh, uh, Disenchantment is used. The uh, what do you call uh, uh, viraga uh, is used. It viraga actually uh, disenchantment is not actually good word viraga for viraga. Raga, as I said this morning, raga means gluing. Viraga means separating the the you remove the glue. So therefore there is no way to hold them together. That kind of uh, uh, separation, uh, removing the, the what you call gum from this uh, desire is what is called viraga. Raga is gluing, viraga means separation from gluing. Next is nibbida. Nibbida means you began to laugh at yourself, you think, gee, how foolish I have been. All this time, all these years, I have been attached to this. That is called nibbida. Nibbida means you have you become disappointed with yourself, with your own state of mind, with your attitude, with the way you dealt with visual uh, sensory objects. That is called nibbida. So, for this purpose, we differentiate or uh, the break various part, the break the body into various parts, 
and look at one of them, each of them separately, to see them breaking down into mere actions. You know, any part of the body when we mindfully look at very closely, very mindfully, uh, penetrating into the very nucleus of that particular object, all we see eventually is just mere actions. When, it, when we come to that understanding, that insight, then we will, uh, we will be disappointed with ourselves for not being able to see that earlier. All these years we have been fooled ourselves uh, and glued to them, uh, not seeing this true nature. When it happens, there is no room in our mind to hold on to any of these hindrances. Uh, so, uh, at the very beginning of um, uh, Satipatthana practice, Atapi uh, Sampajano uh, satima vineye loke abhijja domanasam with effort mindfulness we remove removing uh, greed and ill will continue we continue the practice so greed and ill will are two of the hindrances at the very beginning we got to deal with them in this way Uh, so, Tadanga Pahana means uh, removing one hindrance by using its opposite with the help of mindfulness. Patisam Bida Jnana. This is called Patisam Bida Jnana. Patisam Bida means analytical discriminatory knowledge uh, of our own various parts of the body. When we look at it superficially, our whole personality is discriminatory. Eyes will never agree with our ears, or nose, or tongue, or body. Eyes has its own function, it, has, it does its own thing, it never cooperates with ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind, and body. It has its, similarly, nose never cooperates with the eyes. Eyes has its own function, its own way of dealing with things. So the even senses, our own senses, uh, have their own function separately, as their different faculties. Next uh, way of overcoming hindrances is called Vikkhambana Pahana. Vikkhambana means suppressing. When it arises, we push it down. We generally use a simile of uh, a pot. When we want to uh, get uh, uh, clear water from uh, mossy water, the surface is covered with moss. So we want to get clear water, we take the pot and press it down. When we press it down, the, that particular area, uh, water remains, water becomes clear, the moss will give way. So you slowly push it down and take water. As soon as you put, take the pot out of water, the moss will come and cover the whole surface again. So the tadang, uh, the vikambana uh, or suppressing method of overcoming hindrances is a temporary method, temporary measure. That means so long as you are in that particular state, hindrances all will be uh, away. They are they temporarily uh, 
stay away. Your measure holds them at bay. Your, your method uh, of suppression holds them at bay only for, a, for that period of time. That is what we do when we attain jhanas. In jhanic stage, hindrances will uh, suppress. For instance, uh, uh, ill will will be suppressed at the first jhana. With the ill will, you cannot attain the first jhana. And uh, sloth and torpor also will be suppressed when you are in the first jhana. And uh, uh, restlessness and uh, uh, what you call remorse or worries uh, also you suppress when you attain the first jhana. And doubt suppresses, is suppressed when you are in the first jhana. But they will come back again whenever you come out of jhanas. Now, I like to connect this with the, the simile that I used this morning uh, to illustrate uh, the nature of hindrances. Simile, one simile was <coughs> debt, that is when you, when greed arises, greed is when the mind is uh, obsessed with greed, the person feels like having obligation to return what one has got, always thinking of returning because the person is has borrowed. So, feeling of indebtedness. When ill will arises, person feels, person is like a sick person. When uh, restlessness and worry arises, his uh, mind is uh, like in a uh, dusty, uh, heap of dust. Uh, then uh, doubt, the person is in a, like in a desert. Uh, sleepiness and drowsiness is very much like staying in a in, pri in a prison. So, Buddha says, suppose a person has paid all his debts, every penny the person has borrowed is paid, every penny uh, for your credit card is paid, and you are fully recovered from your sickness, and you are out of prison, and you are out of desert, and the uh, heap of dust is all gone. So when all these things disappear, the person becomes so relaxed, so peaceful, so calm, joy arises, happiness arises out of that. So when hindrances are suppressed in the by attaining jhanas, this is how a person feels and that is how a person afterward gains concentration. But as I said, they are not permanent. How can we remove them permanently? The first uh, hindrance is uh, ill will. We uh, destroy them permanently only when we attain the third level of enlightenment, anagami level. Not anagami path. Uh, in the suttas, we don't see anagami path doing this. Suttas say when you attain anagami stage, that is anagami fruition stage. And uh, sloth and torpor, when you attain full enlightenment, around ship, you overcome, destroy sloth and torpor permanently. And also restlessness and worry, uh, when you attain uh, non-return, third level of enlightenment, your restlessness and worry also disappears. Then doubt, 
when you attain the first level of enlightenment, sotapanna level, you overcome doubt. And of course, greed, a gross part of greed will be destroyed when you attain the third level of enlightenment, and subtle part of greed will be destroyed when you attain the full arahantu. Now, uh, Buddha has given some other methods, yes? Actually, no? What about sleepiness and drowsiness? Sleepiness and drowsiness? Yes. I think I mentioned that uh, sleepiness and drowsiness you overcome when you attain the full enlightenment. Arahantu, I mean destroy fully, completely. Sleepiness and drowsiness. It is not a fetter. No, no. Not a fetter, but uh, uh, you know, uh, sleepiness and drowsiness arises due to uh, uh, lethargic conditions and uh, uh, due to unclarity of the Dhamma, uh, doubtful states, you know, we mentioned them earlier this morning, uh, doubting situation. All this totally be vanished when you attain full enlightenment. Therefore, sloth and torpor will never arise. Yes. Some other methods Buddha has mentioned of, for overcoming hindrances. You find them all in sutras. Uh, one is uh, uh, as I mentioned, replacement by replacing uh, hindrances by their opposites. That is uh, uh, greed by thought of renunciation. Uh, thought of renunciation is the second step of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, we have to cultivate it slowly, gradually. And uh, ill will be overcome by cultivating friendliness, sleepiness and drowsiness by cultivating uh, aloka sanya, uh, perception of light, then uh, restlessness and worry by developing uh, uh, upasama anusati, upasama anusati, reflection of calming. This is called one of the reflections. Then uh, doubt by attaining the uh, second jhana and uh, attaining full enlight uh, what you call first level of uh, enlightenment, uh, you replace or overcome doubt. And then by reflection also we can overcome these all these hindrances. That is uh, uh, amanasikara or uh, manasikara amanasikara. Manasikara means uh, uh, keeping in mindfulness ready. Amanasikara means forgetting. When hindrances arise, try n not to sustain them. Just try to pay. Uh, try to forget them. Then, calming, stilling the mind, we can overcome hindrances. It is just like uh, Buddha gave a uh, simile in uh, uh, what do you call in Sabbasava uh, Sutta that uh, when uh, you walk. No, uh, no, yeah, you run. When you run, you afterward you realize, gee, why should I run? Let me walk. So you start walking. Then you get tired of walking, then you say you, to yourself, why should I walk? Let me st uh, stand. Then you stand. 
then afterward you think why should I stand, why don't I sit down, then you sit down. Then afterward you will realize that sitting also is tiring, why don't I lie down, so you lie down. Similarly, by using various methods, we calm the mind. First we use uh, a very uh, strong method uh, to uh, overcome our hindrances. Then if it does, doesn't work, then we use a very soft method. If that doesn't work, then we reflect on peaceful object. That is called stilling the mind. Then none of these things works. You use that uh, very last uh, resort that Buddha has mentioned in that sutra, that is uh, yeah, especially in uh, uh, Vitaka Santana Sutta, uh, removal of distracting thoughts. The last one is uh, clenching your um, teeth, pressing your tongue against the palate, and uh, exerting all your every ounce of your energy to let it go. Then Reflecting on the uh, requisites we use, that means uh, e food, cloth, lodging and medicine, especially for monastics, Buddha recommended this, this, using them with mindful reflection. Uh, when we use all these things with mindful reflection, we understand the meaning, the purpose of their use. Uh, so that uh, we remain always alert and mindful and would not let hindrance overpower us, overwhelm us. For instance, eating, uh, we uh, said this morning, Lethargic conditions, sleepiness and drowsiness arise when we, after eating meals uh, because of a uh, lot of food. And to overcome that, if we eat moderately, then we would not feel sleepy and drowsy. So even the food can be mindfully used Mindfully, mindful reflection, we can eat food in order to attack our hindrances. Uh, shelter or the seats, the beds and so forth, if they are extremely comfortable, then we feel lazy, drowsy and sleepy. If they are moderate, then we don't feel too sleepy. You know, sometimes uh, I want to say a few words about this uh, sleepiness thing. Uh, sleepiness is not considered to be a virtue in the Buddha's dispensation. Jagariya anujutto. That means living uh, or training the mind to stay awake. This called wakefulness is considered to be a virtue. That means not to have too much sleep is considered to be a virtue. You know people when they cannot sleep, they, s they get sick. That is what they call sleep deprivation, symptoms of sleep deprivation. And we call Buddha a Bisakka Sallakatta. Bisakka means physician, Sallakatta means surgeon. If being a physician and surgeon, he should know that uh, sleep deprivation is not good for health. He, had he known that, 
he would have not recommended uh, a wakefulness as a virtue. But he did. Why is that? Was he unaware of uh, the problem of uh, sleep deprivation? He was fully aware of it. Why we, uh, we suffer from lack of sleep? Because what do we do when we cannot sleep? We keep tossing in the bed, uh, cursing ourselves and thinking all kinds of things, letting all our hatred, anger, greed, you know, bombard our mind. So when we don't have sleep, these are the things we are filled with. The Buddha's recommendation is you sleep, it is specifically mentioned in the Sanghuta Nikaya, sleep first watch of the night. No, no. Meditate first watch of the night. Sleep middle watch of the night. And meditate last watch of the night. That means sleep four hours a night. Four hours good deep sleep is sufficient. Now, uh, That is not considered to be uh, a sickness. I mean, not having too many hours sleep is not considered to be something uh, unhealthy. Why? Because every moment we are awake, we use that moment uh, to meditate. We stay mindful. For instance, when you cannot sleep any time, you can use that time to meditate. You don't have to get up and sit down. Lying down in your bed, keep focusing mind on the breathing. You can totally, completely relax. But don't let hatred, uh, anger, greed, invade your mind. If we keep these things ho away, holding them at bay, relax our mind by focusing the mind on the breathing, then even if we have four hours sleep, we would not be tired next day. We are tired next day normally, because not because we don't have sleep, but because we worry that you could not sleep. That worry makes us tired, not sleeplessness. So, uh, I wanted to mention this in regard to one of the ways of overcoming hindrances, especially that particular hindrance, uh, without any fear of not having sleep. That is why we call the Buddha Bisakka Salakatta. He is a doctor, he is a surgeon, he knows our physiology, he knows our mental state. I think, friends, uh, that's all time I have for this afternoon. Uh, there are many more things to say about, uh, uh, many more things for us to use to overcome hindrances. Uh, many things Buddha has mentioned, but I think this may be enough for uh, us to reflect on, and uh, perhaps some other time uh, uh, we can mention some of them if we have time. <laughs>